I have another knife I want to share with you today. Today it is the Tureva Jacari Puko sent to me by Verustalika. If you're interested in hearing my thoughts on this knife, keep watching. All right, before I begin, I want to thank the good people at Verustalika for sending me this knife so that I could share it with you. So um, this is the third knife from Verustalika that I will have reviewed. Uh, the one I purchased, which was the Tereva Scrama 240, and I've had that for some time. I've done a couple of reviews, including a long-term review. And then I did a review of the Tereva Scrama 200, the slightly shorter version of that larger knife, and I compared the two of them together. Well, this is, was also sent to me at the same time by Verustalika, at the same time as the Tereva Scrama 200, and I've been carrying it for some time now, putting it through quite some heavy use, to say the least, and I'm ready to give you some thoughts. So what I thought I would do is take you down to the stump top, I'll go over its specifications, I'll do some demonstrations of it in use, and then I'll give you my thoughts on the knife. Before we get to the knife testing, I thought I would go over the sheath and the specifications for the knife. Now likely you have learned about these knives since now. They've been out for quite some time but uh, I've put it through my paces and I'd like to give you my thoughts on the knife. So this is the knife inserted in the sheath. We're going to talk more about the sheath in a second right after I go through the specifications but there is one thing I'll point out right now. Although the sheath has good retention already, it does, it's a leather sheath with a plastic liner, it also has a security snap right here that prevents it from being yanked out. I mean, you, you can't even yank it out. I suppose if you tried hard enough, you could, but it's, uh, it prevents it from being yanked out. I really like that feature when I'm bushwhacking and I have uh, the confidence, even though I only keep a tiny little loop on, I've got the confidence that the knife is not going to fall out of the sheath. But when I'm around my campsite, I leave that snap undone so that I have ready access for, to the knife. So I will come back to the sheath in a minute and just give you a few close-ups. So here is the Tereva Jakari Puko 110, standing for the length. Let's go over a few specifications. So the overall weight of the knife, and that is without the sheath, comes in at 6.2 ounces, or 175 grams. The total length from tip to pommel is 9.4 inches, 240 millimeters. The blade, as I mentioned in this part of the name, is 4.3 inches, or 110 millimeters. The blade thickness is 4.2 millimeters, so it's quite thick stock, which is 0.17 inches, and it has an angle of 23 degrees. Then the steel in this knife is 80 CRV2 sharp or hardened to a 59 on the Rockwell hardness scale. Now, there are similarities between this knife and its larger siblings, the Tereva Scrama 240 and 200. A couple of those things are it has uh, the same steel. Uh, it has uh, a lot of the same heat treat and the same functions. It, it has an over molded handle. It is full tang. You can see the protruding pommel, which is also a large ring on the end of it. Um, it's quite, it's the same handle material. It has the same look and finish as the other knives have. So I expect it's going to perform pretty much the same, except for, of course, for its side. It even has that double angle. So it's not 90 degrees, but it is angled off a little bit at the top but it is plenty sharp for doing tasks you might want from the spine of your knife such as striking a ferrocerium rod, peeling bark or fuzzing down a stick or fat wood. So it does all of those tasks just fine. So what else can I say about it? It looks like a Scandinavian grind and in fact I, it depends on how you define that I guess. I would refer to this as a saber grind, not a high saber grind, somewhere between a saber grind and a Scandinavian grind, but it has a secondary bevel right at the very edge. And uh, that's done intentionally, it's so it's not a complete, uh, true zero grind, meaning it's sharpened right down to infinity. It has that secondary bevel, and that makes it much, much stronger in general use. It may take away a little bit of its carving ability, but very little, to be quite honest. 
and for keeping a hair popping edge on that. I quite like that. I don't have to put it to stones very often. In fact, most of the time, well, actually all I've had to do in the six months or so that I've had this knife is to run it down a ceramic rod and then run it over a leather strop. I haven't had to do anything else. No chips, no rolls, no other damage to the edge. And I think it's starting to show that I have been using this knife quite aggressively and uh, yeah, quite aggressively at that. So those are the basic specifications for the knife. Quick look at the sheath. So the sheath itself is leather completely, except a plastic insert. You know, the, I know that sounds very non-traditional, but a lot of Scandinavian style knives use wooden insert inside of a leather sheath. So even though this has more of a look of a Western or more modernized sheath, uh, it's not uncommon for the original or many Scandinavian style knives, including a couple that I have, to have that type of an insert, but made from wood. It has a dedicated dangler. In fact, there is no other belt loop. It is just the dangler. It is quite long and I actually see that as a benefit because I have a, a wide thick hip belt on my backpack and I like that this drops below. Uh, it doesn't in any way make it hard to uh, get the knife out. It is a rolled edge. In other words, the leather is rolled into the sheath right there. That's your push off point. So very sturdy, very durable, very simple, very functional. What else can you ask from a sheath like this? Okay, so what we'll do now is I have a few pieces of wood cut here. I'll quickly demonstrate that this will baton, although I expect you know that it does so already. I'll demonstrate that it will strike a ferrocerium rod. I'll demonstrate that you can cut it, use, not, use it for making notches and a feather stick. So let's do that now. Do you know when I made the review of the Travis Grandma 200, I described the knife as ugly, and now I think that was probably a poor choice of words. In truth, I don't consider these knives as ugly in the sense that they're not good looking. In fact, I consider them actually very good looking in a functional looking way. I guess what I meant is that they weren't so fancy looking or so custom in their design that I was afraid to beat on them with another piece of wood in order to get the job done of whatever it is I'm trying to do. So not ugly, just functional. Not necessarily pretty, just functional. That's the best way to describe these knives. Okay, so what we're going to do to start with is we're going to split out a piece of wood into a couple of quarters and then I'll take them and do a little bit of carving on them, including feather sticks. So this I believe to be a piece of oak. It certainly looked like it. It was just a piece of dead standing that I had sitting here. This is two inches in diameter. This is probably a larger piece of wood I'm likely going to baton with this knife. Not that this knife couldn't be used to baton much larger pieces. I'd have no hesitation driving this knife into something as wide as I could span or working away around the outside and moving in towards the center. It's just that, uh, you know, if I'm going to do some woodworking on larger pieces of wood, something larger than that. That's what the Scrama 240 and 200 are for. So let's just split this down. This is probably 14 inches in length. As I mentioned, a little over two inches in diameter. Well seasoned. Oh, I was wondering why it was taking so long. There's a knot down here at the bottom that I'm driving through right down here. Uh, that just slowed me down. It did not stop the knife in any way. Let's quarter it. That's better, right? Uh, you know, okay, no surprises here at all. This is exactly what I would have expected from this knife. No hesitation at all with it. So what are we going to do here for furthering the demonstration? So I have four nice quarters, some good looking piece of wood. I'm going to set one of them aside or two of them aside for feather sticking. Okay, so all I really want to do is demonstrate very quickly what you can do with this knife, the things that you would expect of any other knife, such as I suppose if I wanted to make this into, let's say, a tent peg. That's probably the easiest demonstration of all. So I have a quarter here. I'm going to turn it into a tent peg. What do you need from a tent peg? You need a sharp edge. So let's see if I can put an edge on this.
at least some kind of an edge. Now, you know, I would probably find another tool like a, a larger knife or a an axe to do this work with. I can do a little bit of chopping, but I don't know. So you're probably asking yourself, Mark, do you make a lot of tent pegs? The answer is no, I don't. And if I am, like I said, I would use an axe or another tool, but... All right, fine enough to drive in the ground, not so fine that it's going to break off. So the other thing you need at the other end of that tent peg is a notch to catch your guy line. So an L7 is usually what you do. You can do it one of two ways. You can beat it in or you can hand carve it in. In fact, today I think I will give it a little touch inwards with the, the baton. Maybe a little further than that. Gone in a fair depth and now I'll just work the notch in with the knife. Clean it out. Okay, no prize winner, functional. That's all I wanted to show is that you can do with this knife what you expect of any knife. This being nice hard oak, the harder I look at it. Yeah, okay, how about feather sticking? Let's see, choose one of these nice pieces of wood and see if I can't do a little bit of feathering with it. All right. So I have knives which will, at least I can feather better with them. I mean, this is feathering. Truth is, you can feather with just about any knives, but some knives do make life a lot easier when they have a nice, especially the thinner the blade is, the thinner the edge is. But there's always going to be that, I don't know, balance or compromise. You want a really fine, fine edge knife that won't withstand a lot of heavy use, or do you want something that is more like a wedge, or do you want something that has a bit of both in it that you can do all the tasks you want of it. All right, just a little bit of feathering on the end of this very hard oak, just, just to show that it can. All right, so let's uh, close up with a few more comments. All right, a few more comments on the Tereva Jakari Puko 110. By the way, if I haven't mentioned, there is a longer version of this knife, the 140, which is five inches plus or minus a little bit. And there's a couple shorter versions as well. One of them looks like the Scrama, more of that Sax design. The other one looks like this, but much shorter. I don't have any of those other knives to test and review for you yet. I may have in the future, um, but this is the one that we went over today. Now, a few comments on this knife. I know that in the past in the reviews that I've watched this has been referred to as the Mora Garberg killer. That this is the competition but at a much less expense than the Mora Garberg is. Well I can't compare. I don't have the Mora Garberg. I'm likely not going to own the Mora Garberg because at least here in Canada it's too expensive for me, or at least for me to justify owning it, considering I have other knives that fill that niche. Um, in everything that I see, the Mora Garberg is a great knife. Um, I'm just thinking, you know, I don't need to spend that much money, and I don't know that you have to spend that much money on a knife when you can have this knife for much less cost. Is it a better knife? I really don't know. I suspect that it, they at least compare. This may be a better knife, if I ever get my hands on a Mora Gerberg, I'll come back and do a comparison. What I can say about this knife is that it will do everything you're asking of a bushcraft knife. Okay, almost everything. The one thing I don't really like using this knife for is food preparation. That thick steel and that uh, wide edge on that, uh, it 
just doesn't slice through things very well. So I have other knives, full flat grind knives, little tiny thin knives that I use for that kind of work. I'll refer, keep this for doing the other bushcraft tasks like processing wood, carving, those types of things. Do you know, I, I haven't tried carving a spoon with this. That's usually something I do with these knives just to see how they feel. I can tell you that with the work that I've done with this, that handle remains very comfortable to me quite grippy. It has good feel. It fills my hand nicely. Here's what's interesting. I have an extra large hand, almost a double XL hand. I've mentioned that in other videos. Most factory knives, their handles do not fit very well. In fact, I've taken a few of them that I've received and modified them after I reviewed them to make them a little thicker through. Uh, this is just a standard thickness, but I think it's wider than many through this way, so it fits my hand better. And in all the carving that I have done with it, I have good grip. I don't feel in any way that I'm not holding on to the knife tight enough. And it's been comfortable, like no, so, no sore spots, no fatigue or no hot spots. It just works. What can I say? It is a simple knife built very, very tough, very dependable and very affordable. I guess that's all you can really ask of a working bushcraft knife. Okay. so. That's all I have to say about the Tereva Jakari Puko 110 model. If you have any questions or any comments, please put them in the comment section below. But until next time, get out and explore and take that path less traveled because it will make all the difference. Bye for now.